Hey guys, welcome back. If you're new here, my name is Becca and today I have a book diary for Crescent City by Sarah J Maas. So it has been a hot minute since I have done a book diary. I just, I really fell behind on posting them and then I just, I couldn't, I couldn't go back and edit them all. So who knows what the future of book diaries from me are. But today is a special occasion. This is a special book diary because this is my most anticipated release of 2020 and I somehow managed to get an advanced review copy of it. So when you're watching this, the book will already be out and available, but I am filming this in January. This official book name is not Crescent City, it is House of Earth and Blood and this is the first book in a series called Crescent City. It is Sarah J Maas's first official adult book and I'm excited but I'm nervous and I'm scared. I'm not even really too sure what the plot of this is about, I just know that it is an urban fantasy and we follow a girl who lives in a world where there's fae, shapeshifters, angels and also there's mention of a demon in the synopsis as well. So I'm not sure what to expect from this, it seems a little shadow huntery which I'm nervous about. I don't love urban fantasy, it's not my favourite type of fantasy at all, I much prefer like historical fantasy. So I'm, I'm a little bit nervous about that because this is her first adult book I'm wondering if it's actually going to be any different than her previous books or whether it's just that this has actually been placed in the accurate age category instead of being put in young adult when it shouldn't be. My expectations of this is that I love it I think there's going to be a really compelling romance because that's what Sarah J Maas is good at. I'm scared because this is only the first book in a series and she does have a habit of making you fall in love with the character and then switching the love interests around so I'm nervous that I'm going to become attached to somebody who isn't going to to be around for a very long time but yeah I'm gonna start reading this book. There is probably going to be spoilers in this so if you have not read this book then I would advise that you do not watch this video. I will be posting or have already posted a non-spoiler review of this so if that I, I don't know I'm filming this so far in advance I don't know what's happening but if that is available I'll link it up here. So if you haven't read this and you want to know my thoughts then I recommend that you go and watch that video. But for those of you guys who are hardcore mass stands like me and have probably binge read this book as soon as you got your hands on it this video is for you. Let's get into it. I'm excited and I'm scared. Hey guys, so I have already fucked up this book diary because I am on page 275 of this book and I haven't told you a goddamn thing. So we're gonna try and do a recap here because I know that you guys are gonna wanna see this video. I considered scrapping it, but I, I need to get my shit together. We still have over 500 pages of this book left. I have plenty of things that I will still need to react to and tell you. So I'm just gonna try and recap what I've read so far which is going to be a hot mess but aside from what's been going on with the romance and stuff in there the reactions i would say have not been that extreme so it's not like you've missed anything crazy so first off what this book is about this book follows bryce quinlan who is a sassy half fey party girl in a world or specifically a city called crescent city that is ruled by supernatural creatures all manner of supernatural creatures we have fey werewolves vampires viper queen whatever she, I think she's just a shifter actually then we have like dragonish people chimera sprites all sorts of stuff her best friend essentially her found sister is a wolf shifter called Danica now a few years before the story starts Danica busts this big terrorist organization thing that's going on that's led by a guy called Philip Briggs who is making bombs to sow discord in the general public so that the humans can rebel against the supernatural creatures and tip the balance so that that humans are not oppressed. One thing that I found out when I started this book is that it is super dense. We have a body of supernatural creatures that rule the city. We also have gods above them that give directions to the government and it, it's a lot and I still don't understand it and I really feel like I could benefit from a map and a glossary. Now obviously I'm reading the review copy, not the finished copy, so I think that there will probably be a map in this. Not sure about the glossary but it would definitely be helpful or at least a hierarchy of the government and the high ranking people and also like a breakdown of all of the different species and creatures that are in here like at a minimum I would say. In the first hundred or so pages of this we have a whole ton of info dumping and it's, it's kind of necessary it's a lot to take in but there is a lot going on in here. This is an urban fantasy not a real life 
realistic fantasy. I can't remember what the name is, but essentially there is a difference between urban fantasy and what people say is urban fantasy. So true urban fantasy is a fantasy that takes place in a urban landscape, but it's not a real world landscape. And then what people call urban fantasy is actually like realistic fantasy. So an example of that would be the Shadowhunter world that takes place in an urban setting, but it is New York City in the case of the Mortal Instruments. So it's an urban fantasy, but all of this stuff is completely made up. I do believe that there is a city in California that's called Crescent City but I don't think it's the same Crescent City. It may be loosely based on it but this series is not connected to the real world unless it stems from an alternate history. So there is a whole lot going on. We do have technology in here however it's like Magitech I think it was referred to. So there are magical elements of the technology. The electricity is not normal electricity, it's called first light. So it is a completely invented world and it takes a lot of getting to grips with. I still don't really understand the full extent of the political structure of this world of 300 pages in. I would say at the point that I'm at now I've pretty much only been in where it's purely plot driven or we're actually getting into the meat of the plot. Less than 100 pages I would say. So in the synopsis of this book it does spoil a big event that happens around the 100 page mark and that is that a whole ton of people die. The people that Bryce are closest to die and this is a grand awakening for her. She kind of kicks all of her party girl habits and tries to lead I would say a better life, a healthier life maybe but she's pretty much not concerned with other people's image of her. She's not told anybody that she doesn't drink anymore. People see her drinking, she's actually drinking water but they just assume that Bryce Quinlan the party girl is drinking straight vodka. This event that happens has left her with a whole ton of trauma. The book pretty much starts off where the terrorist guy that Danica busted from prison is released and then there's a whole mass murder where Danica and the rest of her pack die and Philip Briggs quickly goes back to jail so everybody thinks that's the end of it. Briggs had a vendetta against Danica so it makes sense that he would be the one who killed her. However two years in the future where the bulk of this story takes place there is another killing in the same manica as the killing of Danica and her pack. So the big archangel guy Micah comes to talk to Bryce and convinces her to investigate these murders because they all seem to be very loosely connected to her and I'm guessing that the crux of this book is that we'll figure out at least why these things are connected to her. As the murders are loosely connected to her she is seen as a low-key suspect and also it would be assumed that she is in a great deal of danger. So she is assigned a fallen angel called Hunt Alpha as her personal bodyguard and it's Sarah mass so we all see where this is going. The first thing I want to say is that Hun is divine. I love him. This book is quintessential Sarah J Mass. If you don't like Sarah J Mass, you're not gonna like this book. It is full-on adult romance, territorial, brooding males. The thing that I do like that Sarah has done with this is that she has kind of poked fun at herself a little bit. Bryce is not interested in a territorial male who is going to mate her and then lock her up forever and I can't quote from this because it's a proof copy but there are one one, two, at least two places in here where she has directly referenced A Court of Thorns and Roses. Actually, I think there's a point where she's referenced Throne of Glass as well. So one of them is referring to a mate locking her in his house. Like, that's a hypothetical situation, I would say. Which, I mean, if you know, you know. But there's also a reference to a summer solstice parade where she got a little bit frisky against a wall. Once again, if you know, you know. And then the reference to Throne of Glass does reference a golden-haired, golden-eyed, lion shifter which I mean the cadre am I right? So I do like that she's poking fun at herself here because I also like that it's kind of subtle in a way that if you don't know it just adds a little bit because all of this stuff fits into the world it's not super obvious but if you are a fan of Sarah J Maas if you've read her books many times like I have then you get those references and it's kind of cool I like it. We also have a third main character in here who is Rune Danan who is actually Bryce's brother. Bryce is half fae. Rune is the crown prince of the fae and they share father. Now something went down with them when Bryce was younger where I believe in the heat of the moment he called her a half-breed slut or something like that. She's pretty much never forgiven him for this but he does feel a need to protect her because she is his little sister. So we have their personalities as well and it's just it's Sarah J Maas. It is territorial males trying to protect this woman who doesn't need protecting and coming to realise that she doesn't need protecting but still trying to do it anyway. It's like pissing contests. It's angsty fighting. Every other word 
wet as fuck. I'm, I'm loving it. I'm loving it. So as I have fucked up just reacting to the first part of this book, I'm currently on page 275. I've just read the chapter where there is a bomb that goes off in the club and then Hunt takes her to Rune's house. So I am going to try and check in with you pretty frequently from this point onwards. I mean, it was probably for the best that I just did a quick recap here because there's just so much going on that for the most part, I was just very confused through the first part of this. I mean, aside from this plot line with the murders, we do have a plot line where there was a first light blackout and a fey artifact called the Lunar Horn was stolen. We found out that that is probably connected to the murder of Danica because it has mythical connections to the demon that Bryce saw on the night that Danica was murdered. But we don't know why. We don't know how those two are connected. Like why the Lunar Horn is connected to a demon that was sent to kill Danica. I'm assuming it's something to do with Bryce because all the murders, like I said, are loosely connected to her. But I'm I'm trying to piece it together and I have a couple of theories. Like I think it could be Jessica, who is Bryce's boss behind it, but that's just a low key theory right now. And then of course we also have Hunt's backstory where he was the general in a big rebellion in another country where he joined the rebellion of this angel who has a twin sister and they were both a different side of the war and he was in love with one of them and so he joined her rebellion as her general. But when the rebellion fell, he was enslaved. And now he's working for Micah, who's like the leader of the government, who has told him that when he has killed the amount of people that he killed in a certain battle, he will be released and he's working as Micah's personal assassin. So he has like 2,000 or something people to kill. It's been four years, he's on 84. But he essentially has accepted being Bryce's bodyguard because Micah said if he manages to solve this case with Bryce, he will reduce his sentence to 10 people. He will have to kill 10 more people and then he will earn his freedom. So there is a lot going on here, but I am really enjoying it as Sarah J Maas. I was worried about this with it being an urban fantasy, but I didn't realize that it would be a true urban fantasy. I thought it would be like a realistic fantasy. But regardless, I mean, we have a strong plot. Is the writing a little bit cheesy in places? Yes. Is it a little bit repetitive in places? Yes. Nothing has changed. It's Sarah J Maas and Sarah J Maas at her finest. Maybe not her finest because that was Akamath, but she still has it as far as I'm concerned. I'm currently at the point where the characters are softening to each other because they really fucking hate each other right now, which I mean, I'm not complaining. I love it. I love the arguments. I love how dramatic Hunt is, where he just like storms in and out of places constantly. I live for that energy. But the characters have softened to each other. They're kind of at the point where they're casting aside their assumptions and I feel like the romance is gonna start soon. Something is gonna happen soon because it needs to. I can't deal. I don't understand if anybody read Throne of Glass the year that it was published. I don't understand how you guys could have had to wait with one book a year until like the romance actually got going because let's be real Sarah J Maas she writes fantasy it's good fantasy the plot is good the fantastical elements are great but the fantasy romance is her thing it's where she's really in her element and I don't I, I need the romance to kick in in this book because who knows with this being an adult fantasy book whether the next one will be released next year or in three years I don't know and I can't wait that long for this to become a thing so I'm definitely keeping my fingers crossed for that so I just read chapter 35 and the thighs touched. The thing about Sarah J Maas is that she's so good at like the slow burn and like I mean, you just see the characters like slowly, so painfully slowly softening towards each other and then like their thighs touched and I'm, I'm, I'm almost sweating. <laughs> But I really fucking hope I'm on page 348. I'm just about to start chapter 36. And if something doesn't happen soon, I don't know what I'm going to do because like just the sexual tension is building and building and building. And if they don't explode soon, I'm definitely going to. Sorry, but the way that fuck, the way that she's handling this gun in the shooting range is making me question my sexuality. I mean, like I'm not 100% straight anyway to start off with, but definitely always been more interested in the men in Sarah J Maas books. But I'm just feeling <laughs> some type of way right now you'll you'll know if you're watching this you should have read it but the way it's described that she's handling that gun from hunt's perspective as he's watching it i'm just like Ugh. <laughs> it's so fucking good. Oh. 
So I just read a chapter where Bryce and Hunt go to the Wolf's Den to question Sabine on Danica's whereabouts and whether she was in fact stationed at the Lunar Temple at the time that it was stolen. And that chapter was so hard to read. Like there's a lot of slut shaming in this book. It's not unjustified, I would say. Obviously I don't condone the slut shaming, but it's not done in a way to make the reader believe that sluts are bad. Bryce very much has ownership over her body and doesn't see the problem with being a slut, which is fair. That's her own business, what she does. And the behavior of the pack is they are painted as antagonists anyway, but that was fucking hard to read. And I think that this is just what Sarah J Maas is good at. I've been thinking about the romance a lot in this and what she does that's really effective is that she builds it so slowly that every single touch and every single word gives you that anticipation. So whether the romance actually does happen, it's just that damn good. But I'm halfway through this book now. I'm on page 425 and I care about these characters so much. I'm only halfway through and I already just want to go back to the beginning and reread this and experience it all over again because I don't want this to be over and that's why I love Sarah J Maas that's why she's my favorite author because I just care so much about these characters she writes characters and relationships so brilliantly she writes romance in a way where I wouldn't say it overpowers the story I would say it's equal to the story so you have this really strong plot and this really strong romance that is so fucking passionate and yeah so many people say it's problematic but it's okay to like problematic romances. And in a lot of aspects, problematic content is deemed problematic by the people who are reading it. A lot of people will say that these books are problematic, but there's nothing wrong with an alpha male romance. You understand where the line between having a dominant partner and a toxic partner is. I don't know why I'm talking about that. That was nothing to do with what I was saying here. But <laughs> that chapter, it was just, oh God, it hurt my heart. And for me to feel so close to Connor, who was in this book for less than a hundred pages, and for me to feel bright his pain at having people speak to her like this about what happened with Connor and knowing her regret that she didn't give in for so long and she teased him for so long and then he died and it's like it's like Sam in Throne of Glass but it's different because I feel like even though we only saw Connor for 100 pages, that 100 pages was so much more charged than the novellas in Assassin's Blade. But it's the same, it's the same kind of thing, but I just, I feel it in my heart and my heart feels heavy now having read that chapter. So I'm hoping in the following chapter, Hunt and Bryce have a little heart to heart because he has some fucked up shit going on with the woman that he was in love with. And she has some fucked up shit going on with the fact of what happened with Connor. And they're both so tortured and tragic and they have such sexual chemistry and I'm really excited to see how that's gonna play out because something has to happen soon. I am dying over here. I am, I'm dying and I'm thirsty and I need something to fucking follow through. So I just read the delicious two page spread that is chapter 47 and I swear to fucking God, if one more thing interrupts a romantic scene in this book, I am going to riot. Like. They, they almost, something almost happened and then the chrysalis attacked Hunt and then, you know, all that's passed. He's so grateful to be alive. She's so grateful that he's alive. They almost kiss again. There's a little bit of touching and fucking Sabine walks through the door. I'm so done. I'm so Oh, done. I'm so done. Sarah J Maas really got me this time. And with the last, cha last chapter, I mean, the scenery in that last chapter was so beautiful. They were in a night flowering garden and everything could have been perfect, but they had to be attacked by a demon. And now, you know, it's starting to rain. They're on the roof. A storm is coming and Sabine just blasts in. So yeah. <laughs> Oh god, this book is killing me. I just continue to look progressively worse through this video because I refuse to do anything with my hair. Although I love Bryce and I, I mm, although I love Bryce, she can be a little bit of a bitch. Hunt's just come and tried to talk her down when she pissed off because of what the Awesome King did and what's she done? She's been a bitch. She asked him to tell her about his epic love story with his ex-girlfriend. She has this thing that not all of Sarah J Maas's heroines have because Bryce is definitely more like Selena than she is like Feyre. So she has that swagger and thinks that she's shit but she's not. She's really vulnerable. You know what I mean but like she gets super defensive when she's pissed off so she's just being a bitch and Hunt bless him is a sweet little cinnamon roll he doesn't he's not a sweet little cinnamon roll at all they've had a little spat I hope they'll kiss and make up finally
Oh my god. I just read the chapter where Hunt comes back after he has killed whoever he was sent to kill and he goes straight back to Bryce's apartment instead of going back to the barracks and gets in the shower and turns it really hot and essentially just burns himself raw and like keeps healing because he's supernatural so he has accelerated healing. And Bryce goes in and she washes him and she dresses him and she puts him to bed. <laughs> my heart oh god this book like the romance the romance is happening okay this is it this is oh but god just the intimacy of that i just i'm I just, oh, fucking love this book so much guys do i love this book more than a cut of mist and fury maybe Sick. So it's past 3am now and I'm on page 525 of this and I'm going to bed because I should but I could very easily stay up all night and read this book. I am loving it so much, so much and I'm also hating it because it's doing things to me that's really annoying but I love it. I love it. The catch me being Boo Boo the Fool when I said that Jay Kristoff was my favourite author. Because, like, he is. But Sarah J Maas, you know, she's on another level. Like, I just, I fucking love this woman. I fucking love her books. And this has me feeling all of the emotions. And I, I feel frustration right now. But I also, I love all of the characters. And I love everything that's going on. And I hate that she's doing this to me on purpose. Like, the tension that's building is intense. It's intense and I can't handle it. I can't handle it. I have 275 pages left. I'm almost three quarters of the way through. Advanced review copies, guys, they're not fun. And you know why they're not fun? Because this is a hella big book and it's adult. So SJM is under no obligations to stick to a usual publishing schedule of one book a year, especially as she's now also trying to get out the second Akatar trilogy. So who knows when I'm gonna get the sequel to this. I would say there's a 90% chance that I'm not going to get a review copy for the second book. So I have to wait over a year minimum for the sequel to this and I'm so in love with this. Do I love this more than a cut of Mist and Fury? Possible. It's really fucking possible. I'm just feeling everything right now and aside from the Sarah J Mass stuff, I've fallen down the BTS rabbit hole like wholeheartedly and the music videos are just so fucking good. So my life, aside from working, is pretty much alternating between this book, which I just cannot get enough of. I was thinking about it all day at work today and I just want, because I obviously don't have an ebook of this, so I can't read it while I'm at work. I could take the physical, but I don't want to get ink on it or anything. And then of course, obviously I want to devote my full attention to it and not read it while I'm working. So all day at work I was just thinking about this book and then I came home and I read for like an hour and then I made some candles because I had to and then I've read since like 11 p.m. and it's now three in the morning and I I now have to go to bed but I just want to keep reading and then in between that like when I was making candles I was just watching BTS videos and I am feeling so many emotions <laughs> now which is weird for me because i don't this isn't me usually but this is what sarah j Maas does to me i'm feeling all of the things it's a lot it's a lot to process i don't know what to do when this book is over i already want to flip back to the beginning and just read it all again and just save it every little moment aside from maybe the first 90 pages because they were kind of sad and also there was a lot of information to take in but everything since then I <laughs> This is my favourite book of 2020 and it's like my fifth book of the year and literally nothing is going to top this. Nothing. Like mark my words, this is my number one book of 2020 and I know it is because Sarah J Maas is my favourite author and whenever I read a new release of hers it is always my favourite of the year because she just makes me feel so much and I just, I can't, I can't handle it, I can't. I really can't handle it. I'm not buying that this med witch is who she says she is. She is a lot fucking older and a lot more experienced than anyone would believe. And I think that she is gonna be a troublemaker, maybe not in this book, but later in the series, she's either gonna come over to their side and raise all hell with them, or she's gonna kick the fuck off. I think she's gonna help them though, to be honest, but there's gonna be a big reveal around her. They just kissed for the first time. <laughs> Why am I like this, guys? Why am I like this? Like, this is fucking ridiculous. Be calm. I 
like calmly calm. It's the most fucking ridiculous of times as well. She put it exactly where we didn't expect it. And like, why would I expect it in this scene? Like, <laughs> my God. I need to continue. And it's just Heidi's wings chopped off. I'm not okay. I'm having physical reactions to this book. As you may have noticed, I'm gonna hate watching back this footage in like a week or so when I've calmed down a bit. But it's weird. It's like I have this feeling in my chest the entire time I'm reading this book because I'm always terrified of something going wrong like this or of something going right like the kiss. And I just have like anxious laughter and this feeling in my chest. If I was old, this book would have killed me because I feel on the verge of a heart attack every single time I pick this thing up. And it's kind of like it's only come on through the last hundred pages or so mainly last night and today because I know we're getting to the end of this book I don't know how it's going to end because of the situation they're in where Hunt's a slave I feel like it very well could end where they wrap up the case and he has to go back to Micah and he can't be with her anymore or I don't know I, I really don't know I'm losing my fucking mind and I'm terrified if this this part of the book is going to be hard to read I know Vic just said that his wings are going to grow back in two weeks but this book has taken place over the course of like maybe six weeks aside from the bit at the beginning so it could be a long long time and how is he supposed to protect her without any wings and I thought I actually thought that the punishment would be that he's called off the case which could still be possible either way I'm about to go through the emotional ring and I'm not ready and I'm so, I know there's gonna be a ton of you guys just watching this and fucking laughing at my reactions to this book but like <laughs> I'm so invested Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I'm so happy right now. I'm so happy right now. Oh my god, my battery's gonna die. fucking kiss finally on page 591 we got our first real kiss i don't think i don't i don't oh fuck i'm out i need to go recover i'm sorry but how is hunt the one buying the synth there has to be a reasonable explanation for this how like he knew he woke up like when she left he was asleep and now he's on the boat doing the deal like when did he get up and do that how did he not know that she wasn't there why didn't he question that she wasn't there there's there's something going on here i don't trust this information we touch we break make it seem like we feel the same we love what we hate Can you believe that I've gone from how fucking happy I was like 20 minutes ago to this? <laughs> I can't believe it. She can't. This can't be it. I said to Ashley the other day, I was I was doing something completely irrelevant, and I said, what if it's like every other Sarah J Mass series where, where she leads you to believe that this person is the person, and it's never the person, and I couldn't handle it, and I couldn't, and I, and I knew that this was gonna happen. I'm gonna fucking hate myself reviewing this footage, but I, I knew this was gonna happen, but it can't, it can't, please. Hun can't have been like this all this time. She can't leave it like this. She has to forgive him. He's, she has to go and save him. <laughs> 
I'm really going through it guys and I'm three pages away from part four and I'm gonna leave it there for the night because it is 5 a.m. I'm not gonna be able to sleep. I swear to God, I'm not gonna be able to sleep. Oh shit. I just got to the end of part three and they've got Hunt locked up and Bryce has heard them. Is she gonna go give him hell? I gotta go to bed now guys. It's like, it's past five. I don't know what to do. I don't know, I don't know what to do. This book is fucking killing me. I can't live like this. Just in case I need to provide a timeline for this video, it is the following morning. I have had very little sleep. My sleep was very disturbed because I, I slept really lightly and any time I was thinking about anything, I, I, I was thinking about this book. So I had like probably around four hours, which is sufficient. I'll get by on that. But I've, I, I've, uh... I've read like three chapters and she's gonna go save him. <laughs> she's gonna go save him. I need to shower and I have some things to do today and I don't know what to do because I have enough of this book left that it would take me most of the day to finish it. But I have other stuff to do and I just, this book has consumed me. I can't just go about my day and not read. But I want to do it all in one go. So I don't know what to do. I'm really torn about this. So I'm gonna go for a shower and sort my life out because ew and then i'm gonna go see her save him she said that he can go to hell after she's done it but she needs to do it and i'm like you don't mean that honey you don't mean that so as predicted the med witch was not just a random med witch she's the princess of the witches which i had a feeling she would be something like that i didn't connect the dots which is surprising because looking back there were a few clues there but hunt is currently in chains at the summit but i think something is going to happen here because all of the different leaders from the different sects are walking through and hunt knows the princess of the witches he knows the prince of the fae he knows isaiah and naomi of the angels he also knows amelia of the wolves who is not necessarily an ally but she kind of owes him because it's her fault that he's ended up like this pretty much or had his wings cut off so she feels some guilt there so i think there's going to be a here comes the cavalry trove which is honestly my favorite bryce is going to be going around calling in some favors and i'm I'm excited. I only have 140 pages left and I'm sad about that, but at least I won't be living in a constant state of anxiety. That fucking bastard <laughs> just threw Cyrix into the water with the Nox demon. Is that what it's called? The Nox, the Nox. <laughs> like the revelations in that chapter like i know it did like the whole evil character does the speech that confesses that confesses everything but honestly i was fooled i thought danica i thought danica had done it i thought she was an addict i thought i thought that bit was over and i did think that it was weird that that kind of wrapped up and we moved on to something else because i thought that this would maybe be part of the second book and hunt would go back to micah and then she'd have to try and release him and it's happening now and i thought that was strange but i'm still shocked and shook I'm shocked and shook. I have 109 pages left. God, something good needs to happen soon because I am so on edge. Something that I do feel is a nice touch and I'm really enjoying is that Bryce is using books as weapons in the library and I just fucking love that. Like, hardcore. We appreciate. Lahaba has just sacrificed herself. I honestly did not see that coming. I thought that little tiny fire sprite would be like, end game and i shed a little tear i can't lie it seems like bryce is gonna die from the synth but she kept the little vial of antidote in the fridge and she just necked it as she's assembling the rifle and i fucking bryce quinlan is a badass she is the most badass of all of sarah j Mass's heroines yes she's a lot like selena yes she can be stubborn yes she can be a bitch but she's a fucking badass micah opened the gates to the city and all of the demons from the pit are just spilling out but at the summit everybody's kind of on the phone mobilizing forces and trying to get people in the right places and i don't know what it is about this because it's not quite here comes the cavalry but just loads of people coming together trying to do something amidst all this chaos is just really doing things to me and i love that kind of trope i don't know if it has name but i'm really enjoying that right now i'm hoping that hunt's gonna get free at some point i mean the witch has just removed his manacles so maybe she can remove his halo as well because i'm just waiting for him to fly the fuck off and go and find bryce and then create hell oh well hell's already been created to restore order into the city fighting back to back oh my god it will be like it will be like yora and daenerys in season eight of game of thrones Ooh. I'm excited. Ethan has just mobilized the wolves to give Bryce back up in Asphodel Meadows. I nearly cried then, I nearly cried. Luckily the paragraph was short, so I didn't cry. But here comes the cavalry trope is kicking in and that gets me every single time. Literally my favorite trope in the entire world is here comes the cavalry. Oh God, this book is long. The beginning is quite slow and the middle is good. 
it's very very good but it's all character building and while there's stuff happening and while it was a joy to read and while I loved it it is so worth it for what is going down here because my heart is so full I was right I was right Bryce has powers and the only thing that was really stopping them at the time was the venom in her leg so I'm actually glad that I got that right because I was worried for a while that I was wrong about that and something else that I happened to be right about is that Hypaxia Hypatia is now breaking the spell on Hunt and he's gonna go save his woman and I'm gonna die <laughs> so many feelings in this book I tell you guys I'm gonna die waiting for the next one so it's finally time for me to bring you my final thoughts on this book House of Earth and Blood I'm gonna try and be brief about this because I have a feeling that this video is very long but this is now my favorite book of all time I gave this five out of five stars I thought it was absolutely phenomenal this book has the emotional impact of a final book in a series and this is just the first book there are a couple of things that frustrated me with this one of course being that there is no sex in this she just completely did not give the readers what they wanted here but the sexual tension in here the sexual chemistry is literally fire the ending of this where Hunt is released from slavery it really got me in the feels I'm interested in the sequel to this because she hasn't given us a sex scene and it is pretty damn clear that they are literally about to do it so I feel like the sequel to this has to continue directly after this ends because I feel like having that happen off page would be doing the readers a disservice but the end of this pretty much changed all of my theories for the sequel i have no idea what's going to happen i think that bryce and hunt are going to really struggle to keep her power under wraps i feel like there's going to be a lot of power struggles between all of the parties in this book regarding bryce's power and i'm not sure what the future is for those two i feel like they could be endgame because they are older characters than sarah j maas typically writes so they've had all their time to fuck about. Hunt has already had one love of his life and he has now just found another. Bryce was a party girl, she lost Connor and she also has had a string of casual sex partners so there is a possibility that Hunt and Bryce are endgame but what I'm saying is that aside from Sam Cortland and Connor who was only really in 100 pages of this book, Sarah J Maas has never killed a main love interest. Based on this book and the fact that she reused quite a few tropes, I mean I didn't mind but I could definitely see elements of her other series in this book there is one a possibility that she's going to reuse the trope of changing the love interest and two that she's going to do her usual thing of not killing a love interest because it will hurt too much but there is also a chance with this being adult that she's not going to pull any punches and Hunt could be no more. So those are my main fears going into the sequel plot wise. I'm not really sure where it's going because this book took me by surprise. I didn't expect half of the things in this. I'm really sad about a lot of things in this. Like I'm sad about Lehaba because I fucking loved her but this this book really put me through the emotional ringer and that is why I love it so much. That is why my it's my favourite book. I love books with such high intensity. I can't believe the amount of emotion that was packed into this and that she made me feel so much and yeah just all around. So fucking glad that I read this. Thank you so much to Bloomsbury for giving me the opportunity to read this early as well. But that is about it for this Crescent City book diary. Please let me know your thoughts on the book. I know that my reactions in this video have been pretty damn extreme but they are what they are. That, that's what happened. That's how it be. So please let me know if you have read Crescent City, which I assume you have if you're watching this video. If not, why the fuck did you watch this video? Please also don't forget to like this video if you liked it and subscribe if you want to. If you head into my description box, you'll find a link to my Goodreads Instagram and Twitter if you'd like to follow me on any of those, as well as a link to my Bookish Body Butter and Candle website, the Instagram for that, and a 10% off discount code where you will find a brand new range of five... Crescent City themed candles which I have just launched. I'm filming this outro a little bit after the rest of the book diary as you guys can probably tell if you're perceptive. But that is it from me today guys and I'll see you in my next video. Bye! Oh you bite your friend like chocolate You say you will go when nobody knows With guns sitting under our petticoats We're never gonna quit it, no, we're never gonna quit it, no